Log Talk Radio. Welcome. You're listening to Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio with your host, Darren Batman McDuck. And now, prepare to get fat. Hey, 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 what's cracking? And welcome back to another episode of Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio brought to you by I'm the Fat And I am your host, Darren McDuffie. Good episode tonight. Should be an awesome episode. We're talking about, we're talking to Bruce Fife, author of The Coconut Miracle, The Coconut Oil Miracle, rather. And for those of you who don't know, you know I made several blog posts about uh, coconut oil, and I'm the self proclaimed uh, cuckoo for coconut oil. So we'll be talking about that tonight. But before we get Bruce on, we'll actually, uh, last week, um, really bummed out about last week and uh, we were supposed to have uh, Julia Ross on to talk about the mood cure and my internet is down and if you've been following the show you know I've had this lo- hate <clears throat> excuse me relationship with AT&T and my internet went down again and was not able to get Julia um, on the show but she's promised to come back I don't know when um, I'll be able to schedule her But she's promised to come back on the show, and she's writing another book. I'm very interested to uh, see what book she's writing now, but she wouldn't give me any of the the details. But she is writing a new book, so it'll probably be sometime next year before I'll be able to get her on. But I was able to try some of the things that she said in a mood cure. If you're someone who's suffering from depression, amino acids is good. I'm always one of these people who can't relax, and I seem to have to be doing something all the time. And she suggested that I take GABA, which is an amino acid, and since I've been taking that, I've been able to relax and able to fall asleep like a baby at night. So can't wait to have her back on to get some more of her tips on uh, elevating your mood if you're someone who's out there that's listening to having a little bit of depression or some things that are going on in your life that are not conducive to the way that you want to feel. So I'll be having Julia back on, and I was just a little bit bummed out about that. But if you have not joined me on my Facebook fan page, please do show do so. You can go to Facebook fa- Facebook dot com slash I'm the Fat Man. You can find me there. Please like the uh, fan page, and the more people I can get in there, the more I will start putting uh, things in there about uh, different shows and asking you different questions about who you want to see on the show. But tonight, we'll get into coconut oil. And um, the guy that I have on, Dr. Bruce Fife, I was talking to him about the show. And way back when I made a video about three years ago about the benefits of coconut oil, and I remember I was so excited because my video popped up as number two right up under Dr. Bruce Fife as he, as he talked about coconut oil. And I said, yeah, I, I finally made it. I got someone here um, who's an authority on coconut oil, and my video is still um, one of the great videos there. And I don't know, Dr. Bruce Fife again, he was number one, I was number two. I'm not sure where I am right now because of the way Google ranks things. But, hey, people are still discovering the video and still liking it, and I'm so glad that I can help people out. And most of the stuff that I learned from about coconut oil was from reading Dr. Bruce Fife's um, book um, before actually shooting that video. So I we have to give him props on what he's done with coconut oil. But without further ado, let's bring Dr. Fife on. Give me a second here. Dr. Fife, welcome to Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me, Darren. Well, thank you for coming on this show. I've, I'm a self-proclaimed cuckoo for coconut oil nut, and <laughs> no pun intended, but um, I've been uh, really liking the virtues of coconut oil for a long, long time now, and I've kind of told everyone about that. And as you, as I spoke to you before the show, I told you I had a YouTube video, and people are actually still discovering that video. But I know that you've been researching coconut oil for probably longer than anybody else out there. What kind of led you to start um, really delving in a lot more to coconut oil, this uh, what you call a miracle oil? Well, you know, when I went through school uh, to become a nutritionist and a natural path, we were routinely taught that saturated fats were bad. And coconut oil is predominantly a saturated fat. So I had in my mind that coconut oil was one of the bad fats, and I pretty much ignored it. But um, 
In the 1990s, actually, several years ago, I had a colleague that mentioned to me that coconut oil was actually one of the good fats, you know. And that totally shocked me to hear her say that. And she backed that up and she cited a couple of studies. And that really got me interested because she had some evidence to show benefits to coconut oil. And so I was so curious to find out, you know, if coconut oil really was as bad as we had heard or if there was some good to it and maybe it might not be too bad. I decided to do research and find the answer And the place I went for my research was medical studies because I wanted facts. I wanted to know what researchers were actually learning about coconut oil. And so I started looking up all these articles, research articles on coconut oil. And as I started reading through them, I found benefit after benefit after benefit. I was blown away with all the marvelous uh, benefits associated with coconut oil and it inspired me to keep doing more research. And I looked up hundreds, literally hundreds of research articles. And as I was going through them, I found all these benefits and I couldn't find anything bad about eating natural, uh, regular coconut oil. The only bad things I could find is when people hydrogenated, when the researchers hydrogenated the oil. And of course, any hydrogenated oil is going to have some negative effects. And so I was so, so amazed with this that I said to myself, you know, other people need to know about this. Only these researchers seem to know about this. And so I decided to write my first book about coconut oil called The Coconut Oil Miracle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And here we are today talking about it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've heard this theme. It's kind of a recurring theme. And um, and I remember the first time that I saw it before I read your book, The Coconut Oil Miracle, was a, I saw it where um, – uh, Sally Fallon, and um, if I'm understood correctly, you are the president of Weston A. Price Foundation. Where you are, is that correct, or the? Well, you head? know, I was the local chapter leader for several years. I've I've passed that on to someone else now, but yeah. Yeah, and one of the things um, I remember reading, uh, listening her video on YouTube or watching her video on YouTube, The Oiling of America, and she kind of explained, I don't know if you've seen the video where she explained how we got to the point in vegetable oils. And when I was reading your book, it talked about um, one particular industry that kind of launched the assault against coconut oil to kind of push it out of the market. Can you talk about that and what industry it was and why they did that? Sure. You know, back in the 1980s, coconut oil started getting some criticism because of its saturated fat content. Back then, people were becoming more aware of saturated fats, raising cholesterol, and then that um, they believed that higher cholesterol would then promote heart disease. And so because of this, the soybean industry got together and they said, you know, we could make a lot of money here um, if we exploit this. And so that's what they did. They promoted, they put millions of dollars in an anti-saturated fat, anti-tropical oils campaign. And if you're old enough to remember uh, the 1980s, uh, you may remember a lot of the newspaper articles and, and things coming out demonizing the tropical oils. And as a result, um, restaurants started reformulating um, the type of the uh, oils that they used. Uh, manufacturers reformulated their, their products to get rid of all the saturated fats, including the tropical oils. And so by 1990, basically, Coconut oil had disappeared from our diet. So basically, it was a campaign by the soybean industry to take over the tropical oils market. Yeah. I remember I was watching something. can't remember what it was. But um, on there, they had explained where McDonald's used to fry their uh, french fries in beef tallow. And yeah. uh, and then they suddenly changed everything, and um, they decided to go with vegetable oils. And I'm just wondering if that had – obviously, it had something to do with uh, the whole campaign of vegetable oils are healthy. And we'll get into a little bit more about uh, vegetable oils here in a minute. But um, I wanted you to kind of give us a little fats 101 lesson because sometimes I think that people don't understand fats, the term saturated 
versus uh, polyunsaturated and then uh, mono mono uh, unsaturated fats. So, can you kind of give us just like a brief primer on um, uh, on fats and what the all this terminology means and make it really really simple so everyone out there can understand it. <laughs> sure. Basically, you know, there's there's three fats that people talk about. It's the saturated fat, the mono unsaturated fat, and the polyunsaturated fat. And then, well, people think, well, saturated. Well, what is the fat saturated with and basically what that means is that the fat which is basically a, a long chain of carbon atoms with hydrogen on it a saturated fat means that it's holding as many uh, hydrogen atoms as it can a mono unsaturated fat means it's holding as many as it can except for uh, two uh, there's a link there where two of them link in. That's why it's mono for the one link there. And then polyunsaturated fats would be um, oils that are missing many hydrogen atoms. And that's chemically the difference between them. Yeah. Um, examples of those, because obviously coconut oil is a saturated fat. Monounsaturated would be um, olive oil, correct? Well, you know, there's a little bit of confusion. That, In general, that's true. Every oil that we eat, whether it's olive oil, soybean oil, coconut oil, beef tallow, all oils are actually a mixture of all three of these. And we call, say, olive oil a monounsaturated fat because it's predominantly a monounsaturated fat, but it also has some saturated fat and it has some polyunsaturated fat. So even uh, soybean oil, which we call a, a polyunsaturated fat, it is predominantly polyunsaturated, but it also has some saturated fats in it, and it has some monounsaturated fats. The same way with beef tallow, the same way with lard, the same way with coconut. Coconut is predominantly a saturated fat, but it does have some monounsaturated and some um, polyunsaturated, actually a small amount. Mm -hmm. um, is there a difference between a fat and an oil? Well, technically there isn't a difference, but generally when people talk about fats, they're referring to uh, oils or fats that are solid at room temperature and oils would be liquid at room temperature. That's not a technical definition, but that's more of a cultural definition. Yeah. You mentioned in the book that, um, and this kind of took me by surprise, so I wanted to ask you on, on air here um, about vegetable oils. If they if they are cold-pressed, are they good for us if they're, they're cold-pressed oils? Well, you know, there's a problem with the polyunsaturated oils. Uh, the more hydrogens you remove from a fat, so like with the polyunsaturates, you have many removed, the more unstable the fat becomes. And that means that it's going to break down easier. And when it breaks down, what happens is it becomes rancid. And when it becomes rancid, it produces what's known as free radicals. And free radicals are very reactive um, molecular entities that cause a lot of harm, a lot of damage. Uh, when you have free radicals that come in contact with our skin or inside our body, they tear apart uh, the cells, basically. Uh, they cause a lot of damage. They promote premature aging, the wrinkling in our skin skin as we grow older. Little brown spots that develop on the skin are caused by oxidation uh, due to free radicals. And so polyunsaturated fats are very prone to become rancid and produce these free radicals. And when you expose the oil to uh, oxygen, sunlight, or heat, it accelerates this process. And that's really bad because you go to the store and you have this row of vegetable oils, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sitting there, and you buy it and you take it home and what do you do? 
you stick it into a pan and heat it up. When you start heating up these oils, you are greatly accelerating this oxidative process. And so when you eat foods cooked in polyunsaturated oils, you're eating a very unhealthy product that is going to cause a lot of free radical damage in your body. And these polyunsaturated oils are so unstable that they're forming free radicals while they're sitting in the jar in the store before you even open them up. In fact, this oxidation process starts in the factory when they first extract the oils from their source, from the seeds, oxidation starting. Now, with coconut oil or with really any type of saturated fat, you don't have this because the saturated fats are very stable chemically, and so they don't react like the polyunsaturated fats. So they make excellent cooking oils. That's why they used to always be used in McDonald's and other restaurants and other places because saturated fats are very stable. They can withstand the heat of cooking. They can be put on the shelf for a fair amount of time without going rancid, but polyunsaturates can't. Yeah, yeah. What about, um, while we're talking about um, disease and, and things of that nature, what about this whole, and this, I think this this castle is kind of falling down now. I know. Uh, I think it was Time Magazine did an article on uh, fats not too long ago, and people are starting not to believe that fats are bad for saturated fats, rather, or increasing our cholesterol. What about this whole notion um, about a coconut oil being one of those fats that kind of inc- increase cholesterol? What do you have to say about that? Well, you know, the idea that it increases cholesterol is just stem from the f- the belief that saturated fats, any type of saturated fat, will increase cholesterol and promote heart disease. Well, that basic idea is not necessarily true, and it is not partic- not but true, especially for coconut oil. When people start eating coconut oil, their total cholesterol levels may increase a little bit or it may even decrease a little bit. It's different for each person. However, what happens is when you eat coconut oil, when you add coconut oil to your diet, your HDL cholesterol will increase. Now, HDL cholesterol is referred to as the good cholesterol. It is believed to protect against heart disease. And the higher your HDL cholesterol is, the better it is for you. And so coconut oil increases HDL. And so in some cases, when it increases it, it will also increase total cholesterol, which wouldn't be necessarily a bad thing. And besides, total cholesterol is really a very poor indicator of heart disease risk. Um, Total cholesterol includes both the HDL cholesterol and the so-called bad LDL cholesterol. And you don't know how much of each is in the total. And this is why half of those people who suffer heart attacks have normal or ideal, below normal, uh, total cholesterol um, values. A much better measurement of heart disease risk is the cholesterol ratio, which does take into account how much HDL you have in the total. And studies have shown that when you add coconut oil into the diet, Coconut oil lowers your H, your cholesterol ratio, lowers your risk of heart disease more than any other fat. So if you're going by cholesterol values, coconut oil actually reduces risk of heart disease better than any other fat. Hmm. Yeah, you also I think you said in your book as well that um, one of the other indicators along with the uh, cholesterol ratio was the homocysteine levels as well. I think I remember reading that. Um, With regards to understanding why coconut oil is so good for us, I wanted you to kind of talk about, uh, we went from fats one-on-one, so let's talk about fatty acids one-on-one, where you talk about uh, long-chain fatty acids, uh, medium-chain fatty acids, and short-chain fatty acids short-chain uh, fatty acid, which I did not know existed until I read your book. But talk about those three and, and talk about why what coconut oil is and why it's so good for us. 
Yeah, coconut oil is unique. It is different from the vast majority of fats, including other saturated fats. And basically, you know, um, you can uh, put, um, well, fatty acids, all fats and oils are composed of uh, fat molecules known as fatty acids. And you can put the, the fatty acids into three categories depending on their size or the length of their carbon chain. And so you have long chain fatty acids, medium chain fatty acids, and short chain fatty acids. And the vast majority of the fats that we eat every day um, are composed of long chain fatty acids. I would estimate that 95 to 100 percent of the fats that we eat day to day consist of long chain fatty acids. Now, coconut oil is different because it is made predominantly of medium chain fatty acids. And this is really important because our bodies process and respond to the different fatty acids depending on their size. So the uh, physiological effects of um, the medium chain fatty acids in coconut oil are very different from those that you get from eating fats made out of the long chain fatty acids. And so that's what makes coconut oil unique and different from every other fat, from every other saturated fat. And it's these medium chain fatty acids in coconut oil that give coconut oil most of its incredible health promoting properties. Yeah. Are you mentioned in the book short chain fatty acids being in um vinegar and butter. Are those beneficial to us as as well? They are beneficial to us. Um they are easy to digest. Um our digestive system likes to uh use them for energy. Um, but they don't have all of the health benefits associated with the medium chain fatty acids. Hmm. Okay. Um, you mentioned a couple of times while we were, were talking hydrogenated. Um, can you explain that terminology and why they are uh, so bad for us? Yeah, you know, as I mentioned before, that the polyunsaturated vegetable oils are very unstable, and this has been known for a long, long time. Uh, they go rancid very quickly, and so food manufacturers uh, wanting a, a, a cheaper alternative to saturated fats uh, developed hydrogenated oils. And basically what a hydrogenated oil is, a vegetable oil that's missing a lot of the hydrogen atoms, what they do is they chemically reattach hydrogens to the polyunsaturated oil, making it more saturated. Well, in this process, the uh, molecule becomes uh, deformed and uh, transforms into a trans fatty acid. And this trans fatty acid is an artificial fat. And so when we eat hydrogenated vegetable oils, these trans fatty acids go into our body and our body has, hasn't seen them before and they don't know what to do with them. They, the body looks at it and says, well, this looks like a fat. It uh, looks like a combination of between a saturated fat and a polyunsaturated fat. I don't know what to do with it, but I'll use it like any other fat, and it sticks it uh, in a cell membrane or it tries to do whatever it normally does with fats that we eat in our diet. However, for example, if one of these trans fatty acids are stuck in a cell membrane, since these fatty acids are deformed, unnatural, it... Um, hampers the function of the cell brain. It's it's like when you build a house and instead of using brick in, in, in some of the places, you use styrofoam. I mean, the styrofoam is just not going to hold up. It's going to make a weak spot. It's going to crush. It's going to wear out quickly. The same thing happens to our cells on our cell membrane. If it's if it's uh, formed using a lot of these trans fatty acids, the cells aren't going to function properly. They're going to be dysfunctional, and that will cause 
dysfunction to the entire organ, particularly with the more trans fatty acids you eat, the more trans fatty acids are going to be incorporated into your cells and into your organs, into your skin, into your liver, into your kidney, and it's going to promote uh, premature aging, degeneration, and disease. Yeah, yeah. So when um, you go to the store, when you go to the store ahead. and you pick up a product and you read the ingredient label, and if it says partially hydrogenated uh, vegetable oil, put it back on the shelf. Don't touch it. Yeah, but you just you just explained that most of the vegetable oils they are already rancid when they're on the shelf, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I. And so I, hydrogenate. When 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 the companies hydrogenate it, what they're doing is they're trying to make a a polyunsaturated oil more saturated, yet still call it a vegetable oil. But when they make it more saturated, they're creating these fake fats. Yeah, it's so it's so nuts that um, I remember when I was researching some stuff way back when um, that I came across this graph, and it, and that graph showed that. When we were using things like beef tallow and coconut oil, and you know, uh, uh, what what do they call it? Um, when they lamb tallow or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, when when we were using these things, there was a much, there wasn't really any incidences of heart disease and heart attacks. And then once we started to introduce vegetable oils, that's when the first myocardial and fractional heart attack actually happened. It's just nuts that we still are having people still using these vegetable oils. Whoever did the marketing did a really, really good job, you know? Well, it's really interesting because back in, the say, the 1920s, doctors had um, lived their whole careers up to that time never seeing a single heart attack in their lives because it was so rare in the 19 up to the 1920s and in that time the primary fats in the diet were animal fats they were butter coconut oil beef tallow uh, lard and things like that vegetable oils were just starting to uh, come onto the market um, around the turn of the century, uh, hydrogenated oils were invented in 1911, I think it was, but they were, you know, weren't immediately popular. It took a few decades before they started to get into the diet. And as they did, as people started replacing the healthy saturated fats with the uh, polyunsaturated fats and the hydrogenated fats, then heart disease started to develop and to skyrocket. And so by the 1950s, heart disease had become the number one killer in America. And just that short of a time, from the 1920s to the 1950s, it went from being extremely rare to being the most predominant disease in America. Yeah, I remember that chart. I couldn't believe it. I was like, "Wow, why are we even eating these things or putting them in our food when we know <laughs> really? what what yeah, what they do?" Um, we are halfway through the show. If you're out there listening, if you have a question for Dr. Bruce Fife, um, you can get it straight from him. If you want to know about coconut oil, the number to call in is 646-716-9371. We are actually halfway through the show, so if you have a question, please call in and hit one on the switchboard, and I'll see you and bring you on. Again, number is 646-716-9371. Um, Let's talk about this because this is a very confusing thing for people, and then I wanted to get into another question I have for you on MCT oil. But the difference between virgin coconut oil and then they have another uh, one out there called Expeller Pressed, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, you know, if you go to a store and you start looking for coconut oil, you're going to find basically two different types of oil available. One is going to be the virgin coconut oil, and the other one will be uh, what's known as an RBD oil, or refined, bleached, and deodorized. Uh, and sometimes they'll call it expeller pressed. And basically, the difference is the virgin coconut oil um, is produced with minimal processing. It's as close to the natural oil you get from the coconut oil as possible. And personally, this is the type that I prefer because I think uh, foods that have as little manipulation by man as possible is the healthiest. The other, the RBD oil, um, has gone through more processing, more refining, 
Um, and, you know, it, it, it is still a decent oil because it still has the medium-chain fatty acids in it. But personally, I prefer the virgin oil. And the way you can tell the difference when you go into the store between the two is that the virgin oil will always have the word virgin on the label. It may have other words associated with it, like extra virgin or organic virgin or something like that. But virgin is the word you're really looking for. If it doesn't have the word virgin, then it is the refined oil. It could have any word on it. It could have expeller pressed. It could have organic. It could have pure organic or pure natural or any any type of designation. But if it doesn't have the word virgin then it's a more refined oil. Now, the virgin coconut oil, um, when you open it up, you will smell a little bit of the coconut aroma in it, and it will have some coconut flavor in it. The refined oils have been refined so much that the smell no longer is there. It has no smell, and it has no taste. Now, um, there's benefits, actually, to both of them. Um, I think the virgin one's a little bit healthier, but some people just don't care for the taste of coconut or don't like the taste of coconut in everything that they cook. And so in that case, they might want to use the refined oil because it's odorless and tasteless. Yeah. I don't know where I saw it, but they said the virgin coconut oil is, is really the one that you want to take, and then your expeller press is the one that you want to cook with where you do your, you know, if you want to fry something or something like that, you use the expeller press. Is that is that hold true, or have you done Well, you it know, that way? makes sense. Since the refined coconut oil has already been um, heated in the processing, you know, you could go ahead and, and heat it and cook with it. Uh, the virgin coconut oil has had less heat, sometimes no heat used in the processing whatsoever. So if you want a more natural uh, product that you could use, like for a dietary supplement, just for the health benefits, um, that's, a, that's a good way to go. Yeah. What about the smoke point? I know people are, um, uh, you know, with your beef tallow and things like that, they have what they call, a, I, I think I'm using the right terminology, a really high smoke point where you can heat them. Coconut oil has just, a, just as high as a, a smoke point. Is that correct? Well, not not actually. Um, yeah, the smoke points are the point at which um, the oils start to give off of smoke. And when you reach that point, you are degrading the oil. And whether it's a saturated fat or a polyunsaturated fat or a monounsaturated fat, when you reach the smoke point, you are uh, creating free radicals. You are creating products that are unhealthy, and so you don't want that. Um, some of the saturated fats can have uh, fairly high smoke points. It could be like 400 degrees or 430 degrees, you know, which is really high. Um, and some of the polyunsaturated fats can have relatively high smoke points, but because the polyunsaturateds are uh, more unstable, they actually break down long before they even reach their smoke point. So they're, actually the, the polyunsaturated fats are breaking down at room temperature, and when you heat them up, you accelerate this, even though their smoke point may be relatively high. Now, coconut oil's smoke point is about 360 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's fairly high, but it's not really high. But it remains stable at all the temperatures up to its smoke point, which is unlike the polyunsaturated fats. Yeah, I knew. Does that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that does actually make sense. It's just I know a lot of people are scared to um, actually fry with it, but I've I've had that experience of actually um, making French fries or something like that um, with the coconut oil, and I found out, found yeah. it to work you know, very very good. Um, MCT oil. I've seen a lot of things lately about people isolating MCT oil, and this is a loaded question. Um, is there a benefit to doing that, or should I be taking all of the coconut oil with the MCT oil? And um, I wanted you to kind of talk about the study where they where they took the uh, MCT oil and they gave it to mice 
or I don't know if that was MCTR or MC um, um, linear chain fatty acids. I can't remember um, from the book, but where they where they took mice and gave some of them the MCTR or MCFAs, and then the other ones that didn't, and explain that study and what happened. Well, you know, I'm actually not certain what, which one of the studies you're talking about because there are a lot of <laughs> a different <laughs> studies. Um, but MCT oil, people, you know, will will see that term around, um, and you can f- buy MCT oil uh, in the health food store and online. And what it is is that coconut oil um, is a medium chain triglyceride. That's what MCT stands for oil, but it is uh, 63% of it is medium chain fatty acids or medium chain triglycerides, uh, and the rest are the, the other, other fatty acids. But MCT oil is 100% uh, medium chain fatty acids or medium chain triglycerides. And how they they make it is they start off with coconut oil, and they what's called they fractionate it. They separate each of the fatty acids from the oil, and then they combine certain fatty acids together and leave the rest of them out. Coconut oil naturally contains about ten different fatty acids. The MCT oil. Uh, contains only two. So only two of the medium chain fatty acids from the coconut oil are combined to make MCT oil. Well, um, the problem with that is that uh, the most important medium chain fatty acid uh, in coconut oil is known as lauric acid. And it has the the greatest micro antimicrobial properties and it has a lot of health benefits associated with it but it is not included in the MCT oil during the refining process that one's left out and so in in my opinion then uh, the MCT oil is not as as healthy as plain coconut oil and besides the, the 10 fatty acids in coconut oil work synergistically together to give you the health benefits associated with coconut oil. Now, the benefit of MCT oil is that, um, yeah, it has a higher concentration of the medium chain fatty acids, even though it's missing the most important one. And so you can get a little bit higher level of that. Whether that's good or not, I'm, I'm not totally certain. But the benefit, the actual real benefit is that um, well, if, if none of your listeners have ever used coconut oil, one of the characteristics about coconut oil is its a relatively high melting point. It melts at 76 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So at temperatures above that, it will be a clear liquid, much like any other oil. But at temperatures below 76 degrees, it will start to harden up, kind of like butter is. Well... With MCT oil, it remains liquid down to about um, 40 degrees. And so you can actually even put it into the refrigerator and it will remain liquid. And so you could use MCT oil in cold foods. You can put it into uh, cold drinks. You can put it in on salads. If you did that with coconut oil, it would harden up the oil would, 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 would form little clumps. So if you put coconut yeah. oil in your salad, it would cool down so quickly that it would form little clumps in your lettuce. You know, But MCT oil won't do that. Yeah, I had that experience. I remember when I first started using coconut oil, I would put it in in smoothies or protein shakes, and then I would yeah. <laughs> I would drink them and I would be crunching something. I'm like, what is that I'm crunching? And I figured out that it was the coconut oil that had already hardened yeah. up. But you know, the study I mentioned was the MCT oil where they took, in your book, you, you mentioned where they took the, gave some mice MCT oil and then uh, the other mice they didn't give the MCT oil and the other mice that, the mice that had the MCT oil seemed to have more energy, I believe, in the, in the study that you mentioned in the in your book. Well, yeah, and they, they, there's actually several studies that are, are similar to that uh, where they have mentioned the energy part, and you're exactly right. 
Yes, they would compare MCT oil with a polyunsaturated oil such as corn oil or soybean oil, and they would give that to them. And the mice would have more energy, more endurance. Um, they've even done some interesting studies where they had um, endurance testing in which they took the mice and they subjected them to a swimming endurance test where they put them in the water and had them swim to the point of exhaustion. And so they split the, the mice into two groups. One group they gave the MCT oil and the other group they gave, um, I don't remember which one, but probably coconut or, um, corn oil in their food and everything was the same. And so uh, at the beginning, the first day, the mice performed the same. And the, the study lasted, um, I don't remember how long, three or four weeks. And as the study went along, the mice that were consuming the MCT oil, their endurance increased, and all of them were greatly um, improved over the mice that received the polyunsaturated oil. And so studies like this um, encourage people to start using coconut oil and MCT oil in the sports and fitness industry, putting them into protein shakes and into energy bars to gain the benefit that um, medium-chain fatty acids can, can provide the body. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was very interesting in that in that. Um that study about the about the mice, and I think it was another study you cited about uh, humans too as well. Um, let's get into uh, talking about the parasites because I thought that was very very interesting. And then I'll get to the question that everybody wants me to ask. But um, parasites, and uh, you mentioned, and I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this correctly, uh, giardia. Um, and just yes. the properties of coconut oil when it comes to, uh, you, you mentioned one of antimicrobial, um, it's also antiparasitic. So let's talk a little bit about that, about the effect that it has on parasites. Well, you know, this was one of the things that really impressed me about coconut oil when I first started doing my research because I found study after study after study that was investigating the effects of medium-chain fatty acids um, on microorganisms. And they found that the medium-chain fatty acids um, have very potent antimicrobial properties, meaning that they can kill disease-causing bacteria, viruses, fungi, and even parasites. Um, and this is a characteristic of the medium-chain fatty acids in coconut oil. And they can kill a wide variety uh, of these disease-causing um, microbes, including giardia, which uh, often contaminates water. So there are certain parasites that if you start taking coconut oil, you can uh, expel them or kill them right off. In fact, um, I've had people call me, you know, people give their animals, their pets, coconut oil. And it does all the benefits that happen to people happen to pets, too. And so people whose, whose pets have parasites, they'll be given their, their dog or their cat coconut oil. And in a couple of days, they start expelling uh, tapeworms and other worms start coming out, some dead and some still alive. And that's kind of interesting. But, you know, the antimicrobial properties of coconut oil can kill a wide variety of bacteria that can cause things like ear infections and throat infections, pneumonia, things like that. They can kill viruses that cause influenza, measles, herpes, uh, mononucleosis. Uh, they kill um, fungi that uh, can cause um, foot fungus, athlete's foot, ringworm, uh, even candida. So you can help get candida out of your system by daily taking of coconut oil. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try your suggestion in the book because I know I have a little candida and I need to get rid of it. So I'm going to try your your <laughs> suggestion. Uh, one of the things I found intriguing in your book, and there were so many intriguing things. I wish I had two hours to sit here and talk to you, but I know you don't have that type of time. Um, 
The link between, you mentioned uh, bacteria. They found the link between bacteria and heart attacks. And you mentioned um, the antimicrobial products of, uh, antimicrobial properties of coconut oil. Can you kind of explain that? Because I know I heard this somewhere before about H. pylori, and they found that in uh, people who've had heart attacks that it's a particular bacteria. But uh, coconut oil can help with things like that, correct? Definitely. You know, back in the 1950s, the original idea was proposed that eating um, a lot of fat would raise cholesterol and promote heart disease, and that uh, in the 1960s it was focused on saturated fat and cholesterol as being uh, the primary fats in the diet that raise cholesterol and promote heart disease. And researchers would believe that, and they would do research to verify it and back it up. And the problem was that the studies just didn't, you know, didn't verify it. Um, a few studies kind of suggested it might, but most of the studies actually showed uh, that there wasn't a connection between consuming saturated fat or cholesterol in and heart disease. And over the years researchers began um, focusing their attention on other causes of heart disease because the fat concept just wasn't working out. And what they've learned is that inflammation was far more important as a cause of heart disease than dietary fats. Inflammation in the arteries is actually what causes you know, atherosclerosis and the clogging of the arteries. Well, there are a few things that can cause inflammation of the arteries. One of those is infection, a chronic low-grade infection by various bacteria and viruses that get into the bloodstream and can attack the lining of the arteries and cause inflammation, and they cause chronic inflammation, and chronic inflammation causes a buildup. In fact, actually, cholesterol in the blood is actually put in the inflammation to uh, heal and to patch the damage done by inflammation. So when they look at arteries and see that they're clogged with cholesterol and protein, it's not because cholesterol and protein just precipitated out of the blood and stuck to the wall of the artery. It's because there was inflammation in the artery. There was damage done to the tissues inside the artery, and proteins and cholesterol were used as a bandage to patch it up and repair the damage. Well, viruses, bacteria that we're exposed to all the time, like H. pylori, um, can get into the bloodstream and they can cause this. Some, so some very common um, bacteria and viruses, herpes, for example, can get into the bloodstream and cause this damage to the artery walls. Well, the benefit of coconut oil is that it's been shown to kill these bacteria and viruses that are the biggest troublemakers. And so if you kill them, then your arteries are going to heal up properly. The inflammation is going to go away, and your risk of heart disease is going to fall. And so that's another line of evidence showing the heart protective effects of coconut oil. Yeah, if you're out there listening, we'll get you some coconut oil. Um, this is the probably I have the last question because I know uh, I don't want to keep you too long here, and this is probably an obligatory question. Everybody's out there waiting for me to ask. But coconut oil and weight loss. What? How why is coconut oil so good for weight loss? And can you give some guidelines of how much you should be taking? Because people always ask me this: How much coconut oil, coconut oil should I take? You know, to lose weight. And that was the title of my video I did on YouTube three years ago, and they still are asking me how much should they take. But can you kind of get into why coconut oil, coconut oil is so good for weight loss and then also kind of give us some guidelines of how much you should, should be taking? Yeah. Excuse <laughs> me. Coconut oil is great for weight loss. I mean, it it's kind of seems uh, odd that you can use fat to actually lose fat, but if you use coconut oil, you can actually melt off body fat. And the reason, uh, there's several reasons for that. One of the reasons is 
that when you eat coconut oil, the medium chain triglycerides in the oil are digested differently from long chain uh, triglycerides. Uh, the long chain triglycerides uh, have to go through your stomach and your intestine, and they get packaged into liberal proteins and go into your bloodstream and all that. But the medium chain triglycerides, because they're so small, they digest very quickly, and so quickly, in fact, that they're immediately absorbed after they leave the stomach into what's known as the portal vein, which goes directly to the liver. Mm -hmm. And so these medium-chain fatty acids go directly to the liver, and in the liver, the liver um, identifies them as a source of fuel, and so it burns them for energy. It doesn't throw them back into circulation like it does other fats, it burns them kind of like a carb to produce energy. And so when you eat coconut oil, you get a boost of energy. This refers kind of back to that mouse study where they were given the MCT oils and they had more endurance in their swimming. Uh, the same thing happens to us. We get more energy. In fact, during the day, you know, in, in the mid-afternoon, you kind of get kind of sleepy and tired. I'll take a spoonful of coconut oil and it'll give me the boost I need the energy I need to continue on with the rest of the day. And so what happens is that with this boost of energy, you become physically more active. And when you become physically more active, you're going to be burning off more calories. And in addition to that, when your energy level is boosted, it is also going to kick your metabolism up into a higher level. And so your body is going to actually burn off calories at an accelerated rate. And so even when you're just sitting down watching TV, your metabolism will be elevated and you will be burning off more calories. And studies have shown that after a single meal containing uh, the medium chain fatty acids, that metabolism is elevated and remains elevated for a full 24 hours. So for 24 hours, your body will be burning off calories at an accelerated rate, uh, even when you're asleep, when you're sitting watching TV, uh, and so you're burning off more calories. These are the, are the two primary reasons uh, why coconut oil can be used uh, for weight loss. Plus, another important reason is that when you add coconut oil to foods, coconut oil has an amazing ability to satisfy hunger. And so by adding it to your foods, you become satisfied sooner and you remain satisfied for longer so you don't get the cravings between meals to snack and eat. And when your next meal comes along, you're not so starved that you mm -hmm. overeat, but you eat a normal amount. So you actually end up consuming fewer calories. So your metabolism is higher, burning off more calories, but you're eating less calories because you're satisfied. And so using this the coconut oil, you can <clears throat> properly use it to help lose excess weight. Now, some people just have added coconut oil into their regular diet, and they've noticed the pounds just coming off. But that doesn't always happen because the type of foods you eat also influences how much you weigh and how much weight you gain or yeah. lose. And so um, you need a proper diet. And when you add that to the coconut oil, you can make a very good weight loss program. Yeah, so you just mean we can't go out. I can't just get a teaspoon of coconut oil and then go and eat Burger King and McDonald's. <laughs> Expect to That's right. You can't eat a spoonful of coconut oil and then go out to Baskin Robbins and load up on ice cream. <laughs> that won't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, with regards to metabolism, I read someplace as well where it's very good for the thyroid, your thyroid gland. Is, um well, yes, because it boosts metabolism of the body, it also boosts the metabolism of your thyroid gland. And your thyroid gland is the, the gland that governs your natural metabolism anyways. And so coconut oil basically kind of kickstarts a sluggish thyroid and gets it running like it's supposed to be. And once it's running like it's supposed to be, then it can keep your metabolism at an elevated rate where it's supposed to be. 
Yeah. So um, lots of times when, when people start adding coconut oil into their diet, if they're taking thyroid medication, they need to check with their doctors so their doctors can start lowering their dose. Yeah, yeah. Um, with the regards to guile, I've heard two different things, and this, this is the last two questions here for you. Um, one would be, should you take it before or after your meal? And then the other one would be just how much to take. I've heard people say, you know, you go by your weight. Um, for me, I was taking upwards to like four tablespoons a day and didn't really feel anything um, um, by that. But, I mean, is can you get to a point where there's too much coconut oil or what can be just some general guidelines for the people that are out there listening? Well, I recommend that people take it either with their meals or before their meal, um, and that will help. And if they take it with their meal or before their meal and eat at a rel- relatively slow pace, you know, some people just scarf every da- thing down in one minute. That would and be so me. They can- <laughs> 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 that way you, you, you eat before your body is satisfied, but you eat slow enough the coconut oil will trigger the switches that say, I'm satisfied, stop eating, and so you tend not to eat as much. So you should use the oil before or with the meal and not afterwards. I recommend, actually recommend that people uh, consume the oil with foods. You can consume it uh, by itself like a dietary supplement, and I do that. Um, but generally, people aren't accustomed to eating a lot of fat and they can overdo it because their body's not used to it. I can eat a whole lot of fat. I can down many tablespoons of coconut oil a day and have no problem. Someone who's just beginning to add coconut oil into their diet may need to limit themselves to, say, one tablespoon a day. And if they do okay with that, then they can gradually increase it. Um, the worst the coconut oil will do will may make you feel a little nauseous or give you a little bit of diarrhea if you're not accustomed to having a lot of fat in your diet. But as you start adding it into your diet, that these symptoms go away um, and you can handle as much as you need to. Now, how much coconut oil do you need to take? Well, I generally recommend um, actually... Any amount is good. So one to three tablespoons a day is a is a a nice maintenance type dose. If you want want more effects from the oil, you might want to start taking four or more tablespoons a day. Even with weight loss, you know, people kind of think, well, if I add too much fat in my diet, they look at all these calories that I'm adding to my diet. But no. Step back and look at what I just said about weight loss. The coconut oil satisfies hunger. It gives you energy so you burn off more calories. It gives you a higher metabolism so you burn off more calories that way. So if you eat more coconut oil, it's going to have more of an effect on all of these to help you lose weight. So if weight loss is your goal, then three tablespoons is not too much. Four tablespoons is not too much. Five tablespoons is not too much. In fact, I've just published a new book. I'm, I don't even know if you're aware of it, Darren, um, but it's called the the Coconut Ketogenic Diet. Oh yeah, it's I did based see that. on weight loss and the best way to lose weight without suffering any type of uh, hunger pains and to lose it quickly. And basically in that book, I explain how you use lots of coconut oil, more than four tablespoons a day, to help you melt off the pounds quickly. Yeah, and one more question. I know I said the last question, but a question I get all the time, too, and and you and I spoke about this off the air before we came on, and I almost forgot to ask about it. How can you tell if you have a good coconut oil? Is it by smell, by taste, by color? How, How do we know that if I go to Walmart and I get a coconut oil out there, is it a good coconut oil? Well, you know, there's a lot of different ways to process and extract coconut oil and they'll give a little bit of variations on the end product and but regardless really of how it's processed when the nuts are picked and all that um, they all have the main ingredient the medium chain fatty acids that work the miracles of coconut oil and so any brand will be benefit 
beneficial. However, because the taste difference, what I recommend is that you buy and taste several different brands, and the one that you should use is the one that tastes best to you, the one that smells best to you. Now, I've admittedly, I've had some coconut oils that have tasted kind of bad and smelled mm-hmm. kind of bad, and I'd never used those. But there are so many that taste excellent um, and smell wonderful. And so most of the ones that you find in the health food store um, have passed a test, basically. They passed the customer acceptance <laughs> test, and they're pretty yeah. decent. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to ask that because I get that question a lot from people. How do you know if it's good or bad? Um, is there anything else you wanted to add about coconut oil before I let you go, Dr. Fire? Well, you know, we've talked a lot about some of the major benefits of coconut oil, but there are lots more that we haven't talked about. Um, I recommend that your listeners, you know, investigate it more. Come to my website, um, which is www.coconutresearchcenter.org. It's an educational site. There's no selling or marketing on the site, but it has lots of articles. It has research, it has studies, it has news, what's happening in the world of coconut. Uh, and it's very educational. Yeah, we didn't even, I mean, your book uh, has a lot of information in there, and I don't think I even quote covered but a quarter of your book, but I didn't want to give the uh, audience the whole book. Go out, get the book, read it. You can pick it up on Amazon. That's what I did. You can read it. I just got a new Kindle for my birthday, so I was reading your book on my Kindle, which is great because I can underline and highlight things while uh, as I go through. So go out and get the Coconut Oil Miracle. You can go to Dr. Uh, Bruce Fife's uh, site. And Dr. Fife, thank you for um, coming on tonight. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, Darren. All right. Look to have you back on sometime next year. We'll talk a little bit about palm oil as well. But um, have a good night, and again, thank you for coming on. Appreciate it. You bet. We'll see you. Uh, All right. Good night. All right. That's a good show. Um, And again, we didn't even cover half of the information in the Coconut uh, Miracle book. Coconut.